Storytelling is an integral part of medicine and healing. This episode explores the role and art of storytelling, which is also known as narrative medicine. And this is explored in the context of care for pain patients and healthcare in general. So stay tuned. Pedia Pain Focus. You're listening to Pedia Pain Focus, brought to you by Proactive Pain Solutions. Pedia Pain Focus highlights pediatric pain information and provides tools and resources for all healthcare professionals taking care of children dealing with pain. Here's your host, Dr. Anjana Kundu. Hello there. Welcome to Season 2 of Pedia Pain Focus, and I'm your host, Dr. Anjana Kundu. If you're thinking Season 2, what? Well... You know that the podcast had been on a hiatus for nearly a year now, but we're back. And back with many great episodes, starting with themes around communication, storytelling, and narrative medicine. Although these episodes were recorded before the current global coronavirus pandemic, however, I want to assure you that these are just as relevant now, if not more so. Because right now, we all need to come together, need to communicate better and understand each other better. We need to create narrative stories and perspectives that will influence not only our current response to this crisis, but also it's going to shape the legacy and the stories that we leave for many generations to follow. Effective practice of medicine requires narrative competence. What is that, you ask? Well, narrative competence is an ability to acknowledge, understand, interpret, and respond to stories and plights of others. Through storytelling, a clinician can better understand their own patients in their illness, as well as they can recognize their own personal journeys through medicine. They can foster kinship and supportive environment for other team members and healthcare professionals, as well as globally positively influence the healthcare outcomes. Now, we have all experienced power of storytelling in our own personal and professional lives in some form or the other. And I'm sure you'll agree that the most memorable experiences of our lives are either connected to stories or they end up creating some beautiful ones. Similarly, in medicine too, the ability to diagnose largely hinges on a healthcare professional's ability to accurately elicit the story from their patient and their family. We also know that the quality of the report that gets built between a clinician and a patient, that is greatly influencing the outcomes of the treatment plan, as well as how engaged the patient and the family are and how satisfied they are with the care they receive. And as we will learn in today's episode, the power of words and stories is essential to our role as healthcare professionals in serving the needs of our patients and families properly. My guest, Ms. Elizabeth Turner, is an expert in expressive writing and healing storytelling. She and I met at a patient and family education conference where I got to witness the power of her work directly with patients and families of chronic pain patients. And seeing the impact that she had on those patients and families, and given her incredible background, I felt compelled to explore the role of storytelling in our lives as healthcare professionals, as we also deal with some of the most complex issues when caring for pediatric pain patients. I'm confident that you would love what she has to share, and you're going to find it incredibly helpful. All the gems that she has to offer that you can take and put in your practice and implement them right away. She has so much great stuff that she had to offer, and our conversation was so rich And we weren't running out of ideas and skills to put into clinical practice at all. 
but it was a long conversation. So I felt that I needed to bring this content to you in two parts. Firstly, to do it justice, and secondly, so that I could allow you all to fully absorb all the nuggets of wisdom at your own pace and comfortably without missing out any minor details because every bit of it is very important as you're going to experience it. So without further delay, let me invite our guest, Miss Elizabeth or Beth Turner. Thank you so much. We met in Orlando. It seems like it was, you know, so long ago when our talking back and forth to, you know, try to bring this to listeners and just our preparation. So thank you for, you know, just being so welcoming and encouraging. And I do think that what we talk about you and I today will will really be helpful, very impactful. And I'm also hoping awakening like, oh, wow, this isn't that hard and I can do it and I can learn some things and it's, it's not too big and it's not too much. I sure hope so. And I don't think it is too big and I think it's going to be extremely helpful. So I can't wait to dive in. But before we do that, what I would love for you to do, Beth, is I know I've had the opportunity to know you a little bit through our conversations and also, as you mentioned, when we first met in Orlando. And that's what I told our listeners why we're doing this story um, telling podcast. But I would love for you to uh, to give us a little bit of your background. So what got you to this point? How did you get interested in expressive writing and healing storytelling and creating a company, which I believe you um, that that helps people foster these skills? Yes, it is. The business is called E3, which is really encourage, empower, and equip. That's what the three E's stand for. And the basis is, like you said, expressive writing and healing storytelling. And the um, the roots of it were when I have a background in broadcast television news and was a reporter and an anchor for various news outlets for years, Chicago, San Francisco. And then when my husband and I moved back to Madison, uh, my husband had founded a video production company and I had done some work with him. And then I always had a passion for words, a passion for storytelling, but you know how you're living something and you don't really know that what you're living is a story and in and of itself. And Mm -hmm. it just came to, you know, just like a lot of people can resonate with that. You're thinking, I'm just living this thing. I didn't know it was a story. And uh, it came to this intersection in time when we were, my husband and I were invited to go and uh, work with some women and children coming out of trauma in, um, in the Middle East. And it was, you know, kind of an intense invitation. And I thought, you know, I've done a lot with telling other people's stories. What would it look like if they told them their, you know, themselves, how do you equip them to really tell their own story, to awaken to the power of it and the healing aspects of it? So that's what kind of started the journey. Definitely. That was the, the catalyst was how to awaken people to really powerful positions within their own story. And that started the venture into training and research and equipping with some of the pioneers in this field And I, you know, at the end of this podcast and, you know, for people who want to know more, there are resources that are out there and they're easily digestible, uh, research based. And that's what led me, you know, to this to this point. And especially when it came to medicine, because storytelling is medicine in my thoughts anyway. (laughs) That's a very powerful statement. And we will definitely dissect that. But before we go there, I, I was struck by your statement saying, so how do you equip them to tell their stories. So how does one tell, like, how do you equip them to tell their story? I think the biggest thing really is just to awaken them, just to say, oh, you know, storytelling isn't complicated. It is the way we connect to ourselves, the way we connect to one another. It's uh, part of our DNA. It is part of survival. You know, it goes back to a long time ago. It's what we do naturally when we sat around, you know, campfires or fires at night to, to share things. And oral tradition is huge. So I just think the, the most important thing is just to say that it is, um, it's a way of being mindful and expressing that. It's a way of slowing down and relaying your thoughts and relaying what's going on and listening to the words that you use. I don't think 
the biggest part of the practice is really awakening people to their word choices. Uh, words are how we think and story is how we link. And I want to attribute that quote, I believe, to Christina Baldwin. She's got a, a book called The Story Catcher, and she does an awful lot of work with storytelling. Anyway, that is becomes important because the story becomes your atmosphere the story becomes your climate. You carry that with you where you go. And if you're a patient, it's into a doctor's office. Um, if you are a provider, then you carry that atmosphere, you know, with you when you go to see your patient. So it's important to say, hey, you know, what kind of house am I building out of this story? What kind of emotions uh, does it carry? What kind of memories? And am I, is it true? You know, or am I believing things that are not true and they have found their way into my story and I really have to challenge them now. Hmm. So the biggest factor I really think is in your question is really awakening. Wow. I didn't know I was using that terminology. I didn't know I was using that language. I didn't know that emotion was hidden in there. It's a great hmm. awakening process. Hmm. So basically awakening to the choices of words and how you present the information, whether it's to your own self or to those around you that you influence. Excellent way of putting it. Yes. Just to, mm -hmm. to wrap it up neatly. It's also a relationship. You know, it's, you know, if I'm the storyteller, it's my relationship to myself, to mm -hmm. other people, to my past, to my future. It is a relationship and it's a great opportunity to look at how we're relating to our stories, how we're relating to who we are, what's happened to us, what we think is going to happen to us. So it's a good way to look at it as far as a relationship too. Hmm. I never thought about it that way, but that is um, that is a powerful way of thinking. And of course, you know, medicine is relationship. It's a relationship building and it's like um, a, a very trusting relationship, actually, even that. So I can imagine from just that perspective um, that just a very relevant thing to do in medicine, the story using use of storytelling should be very relevant. But other than that, why why do you think, why is storytelling that important in medicine per se, or especially, you say, for pain management? It's just interesting in the fact that it's just the way that our healthcare system is moving. It is the way that it's flowing, and it's been kind of going in that direction. And, and you probably have seen it over time, you know, way back to almost on the cusp of 1980 with John Kabat-Zinn uh, working through patients with mindfulness-based stress reduction. This was just to, hey, get a group of people together to explore healing storytelling and what has now in meditation. And that just became this little tiny little, you know, pilot that was just like, hey, a test run. And it's like, wow, this is really helpful. This really creates some self-awareness. This wakens empathy. There's some compassion in this. And then it just, you know, kind of seemed to build on this. And then rolling, you know, about 20 years later than that, Columbia University in New York said, and I'll just quote this as a small part from what they had said, that among the many responses to the failures of our current healthcare system is narrative medicine. So Columbia University, you know, more than 20 years, almost 20 years ago, developed uh, MS in narrative medicine, just as a way to say, hey, that, that, um, that the healthcare profession realizes that the caring of sick people unfolds in stories. Mm. And that they were saying, hey, we recognize that the central event of healthcare occurs when the, the patient gives a story of what has happened to themselves and the provider listens. Mm. Then there's a relationship. So that's where it has gone. And then it was, you know, it was kind of, it was received, but it's like, well, what's the research? And then the research started to really start to roll in too, saying, uh, there are benefits to the provider. There is effectiveness in the among or amongst a team that was treating a person with pain. It also showed that, hey, if somebody with pain had a chance to actually be heard and felt that they were empowered by the telling of their story, that there was uh, indications that the pain could lessen. It takes them out of a hyperarousal state. There's a lot mm. of sense to it, but you know, it's Genesis was, well, I mean a long, long time ago, but then rolling into healthcare in the West, in the Western world, you know, has, has taken a while to really catch on, but it's gaining traction, you know, especially if I'm probably sure you're seeing it too. Yes, for sure. I, I think that, uh, you know, 
especially because I've had a chance to work with the Native American um, populations doing pain management. I mean, those are some of the hardest populations to be able to reach because they're, they don't live in very accessible areas and to be able to get them good health care and especially sort of pain management being an integral part of of their needs. And one of the things that we, when we ended up doing some sort of initial fact finding and just, just sort of building of resources and the system to help engage them, the biggest thing that we found was obviously their, their cultural relationship to healthcare was through storytelling really. And even a lot of their healing um, practices are based in that tradition of storytelling. So yes, I was fortunate enough to get exposed to that. But then, like you're just saying, I am I am definitely seeing more and more, uh, as you mentioned, Columbia Medicine has gone even way beyond and created a master's degree in narrative medicine. But even normally, like communication, the emphasis on communication becoming a core part of our training um, and and even sort of nowadays, this emphasis on emotional intelligence, this is all about how you listen and how you communicate, impart information. And so we can call it by all sorts of different names, but I, I guess, you know, that would be my interpretation of how storytelling is is becoming such an integral part of how we care for each other, whether it's healthcare or even in personal lives. Yes. And that's beautiful that you had a chance to talk or work with Native American population because there's a lot to be learned. There's a lot of wisdom that things that have probably been ignored. And that's that's too bad because they do have a lot to teach us, a lot of wisdom um, with even the basics because there's some things that even come down to storytelling because it carries emotion. Um, a lot of other cultures are very wise to quantum physics and frequency and vibration. And we're kind of like, yeah, what is that? Well, you know, emotion carries that, uh, stories carry emotion and that carries a pulse. And so it's very important to awaken to that. And I, I could just see how you would have been really well awakened to the impact of storytelling through working with that population. A lot to learn yeah. from that. Yes, indeed. Uh, Beth, I want to go back to something you said earlier, which was very, um, very interesting to me, was mentioning John Cabot's and, and you know, I, I'm trained in integrative medicine, mind-body medicine, and I definitely use those modalities as part of my integrative pain care. Um, but it was very interesting to hear you say that mindfulness is integrally related to basically storytelling. So do you want to elaborate a little bit on that? Like how are mindfulness and storytelling related? Storytelling just slows down the whole process. And I just look at it as it's mindfulness being expressed. You know, you and I can go through a mindfulness-based stress reduction program. That becomes kind of an individual thing, although you're doing it in a group. The storytelling really invites somebody else in, and there's a role to play. There's a listener and an expressor, a speaker and a, and a listener. And also that it just slows down the whole process. It's, um, you know, kind of alluded to this in the beginning that storytelling becomes the medicine of the moment. Mm -hmm. So it is, I have to be as a, as a patient, I need to be aware. My role would be, okay, what words am I using? Am I being clear? Have I written this down? Have I made a timeline, maybe a little bit of a journal? Because while I've been listening or living this, my provider has maybe 20 minutes, a half an hour um, more if it's a specialty. But what can I communicate in this to get the help that I need? And then as a provider, it just slows everything down too to say, hey, that I'm going to meet in this place and I'm going to leave the external chatter outside and just honor this person by so-called holding space, which is really just to listen to listen without judgment, to, without like needing to fix solve like quickly, impulsively, without taking all the information in. And you become very, very skilled at listening because you can start to say, oh, this is key. You start listening intuitively instead of just getting into the brain. It's like, oh, there's a little ping there. I need to go back to that part of the story. A little ping. Oh, that might be a link to something else. So it also brings the provider into a state of 
awareness too. Awareness like, oh, if I'm the provider, how come I'm getting frustrated or agitated right now? Just to be aware of like, oh, these are my own responses. And now I can choose a different response or I can choose also to move this time with a patient into a different way. We can take this into a place that's going to get some more traction and I can get some more answers. So you become very, very skilled at listening and asking the right questions and following up. It becomes, you know, like investigative, but with a heart, really with, with compassion. And just to point out that, you know, my own experience just with working with people who are in the healthcare profession and mental health, it is incredibly difficult to get in for people to have therapy, like mental health therapy for anything, usually six month or longer waiting lists. And a lot of that I feel in personal experience and relationships with my clients would be to say, you know what, a lot of healing can come if somebody could just listen. Can you just listen to this piece right now and that they feel heard? That alone is very healing. So that's Mm. the mindfulness part because, oh, I'm here, you are here, we're together, we're in this little frozen moment of time. Let's use this as compassionately um, and effectively as we can to be able to get the help that's needed. Absolutely. I would completely agree with you on that. And I have to admit that there are times when, you know, we're, especially in medicine, we're faced with situations where uh, things aren't that clear. We don't know enough about some very unique conditions and, and pain medicine, unfortunately, still remains a lot of um, unknown still exists in, in, in the area of pain management. So a lot of times my patients, they'll, they'll leave my clinic much happier or just happier just because they felt heard. One of the most common sad report that I hear from my patients and families is not being heard or not being believed. And it's not that I'm giving them any special you know, uh, prescription or I just fix their pain. Sometimes it's just the fact that I've validated, I've heard them and just validated them and shared maybe, you know, what I know, just explaining this in a way that they can relate to, or at least they feel like somebody heard us and this they gave us something to think about or learn or, you know, just something to focus on. And that itself makes a huge difference in how they leave your clinic. It does. And does that really take you a lot more time to say, I believe that I'm hearing you. This is what I am hearing. Am I accurate on this? I understand. Well, understand can be a a, a little touchy statement at times because, or I have heard this before. This is not uncommon. That breaks down isolation. It's all the choice in the language rather than having, you know, come in and not be heard or to be, or to be told as a fact, you walk in as a, as a number, as a statistic rather than a story. And really you're listening to what is beyond the pain, the pain or pain is a word. It's not their story. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in, in your position or provider's position, you get to really help the patient move out of allowing pain to be the central character in their story, they get to come back and be the central character. And pain, you know, can take a seat or it takes a role or it's a costume change or it's a chapter or a line, but it's not everything. And that is the power that a provider has by listening. Mm, You brought up a good point about time. And that is, as you know, Beth, the healthcare landscape is changing. You've seen it. We've all seen in our lifetime. And the worst, and it's not, unfortunately, a lot of the elements aren't changing for the best. And one of them is the time factor. It seems like the time allocated to each visit is getting shorter and shorter. And then I can totally hear a lot of my listeners saying, you know, I have 20 minutes to get all the information out of this patient, including their their pain being one of the things, but everything else that impacts it and how we can get them to engage in their treatment process. So with that kind of limitation on the time for the visit, how do you make it most efficient? How do you make it most effective? And then I guess the second part would be, we also, as physicians, we get trained in medicine. We don't get trained 
in storytelling. And that's too specific to healthcare. Like how do you weave stories into a scientific discipline? So those two, like if you can take those one by one and um, we will sort of go from there. Absolutely. And there's just, even you and I had spoken about this a little bit earlier too. You know, I pointed out just speaking with people that I do know uh, who are in medicine and they're most of them are, are fairly in a high volume setting. And there is pushback on that, you know, about narrative medicine or, or listening or what is being called storytelling. And it, there are a lot of different names for it, but the general idea is storytelling is narrative medicine. And the comments have been, oh, you know, that's a nice idea. That's not easy. If I'm not going to be measured on it, then am I really going to be doing that at the end of the day? And some of them had said, I just I can't because I'm not being measured on that. And I have other things that I need to be focusing on. So I understand the little slices or pieces, you know, of that mindset, but there is a way to do it. We can go through briefly, you know, what a provider can do. And then those things can be adjusted. Mm -hmm. You know, they can be an abbreviation of what you're doing, but I just want to make it really clear. What I'm talking about is not something more to do. It's just to be. Mm. It's not a doing, it's just a being, a different way of being, being with the patient, being with yourself. It's a different way of looking. It's a different perspective. So that's all that it is, is really a shift. So the first thing is that you just breathe. You just take a pause before you walk into the next um, appointment, before you come into the next encounter. The second thing is just be aware of the impact that you have. It's very vital. There's an opportunity, you know, in in, uh, mental health and psychology, they call it liminal space, which is a threshold. It's like, this is where this person is, and this is where they're going to maybe go. And myself as a provider, um, really, I really have a very integral part in the trajectory of this story. So just be aware of that. Active listening, which is really not complicated. All it is, is reflective, taking time, really listening, like, tell me a little bit more about this. Let's pause here. I think this is important. Let's focus a little bit more on that. This is what I'm hearing. Am I following you correctly? Also following up to say, hey, this is my role as your provider. This is your role as a patient. Does this seem clear to you? You can do a, a quick assessment too. You know, how on board is the patient? You know, there are resources out there just for some really quick questions on motivational interviewing, just to say the biggest thing is really empowering the patient. And that is just being awake and being actively engaged in that in that waiting room or in the examination room or following a lab report or following a uh, an x-ray. Words like, this is what your blood is telling me. This is what this picture is telling me right now. Related back to, you know, if you're the provider, related back to a story or somebody else's story or something you remember, you know, as a child that can connect. Uh, Also awakening just to your language. You know, personal encounter has been with a large treatment medical facility here where there is a lot of fear. It's like a scaring into the diagnosis, you know, the The patient picks up on that. They shut down. That's not a good thing. So it's awakening to the uh, impact of language. Make sure it's not inflammatory. Like this is always going to happen. This will never change. Even words about chronic. I have some issues with telling somebody this will be forever ongoing, always this way. That's also not leaving a little bit of room for growth, for change, for mystery, and also sometimes the miraculous. And that's a really important place for a provider to be aware of. And also just setting boundaries, managing expectations. This is where I can help. This is where I would start. I want to bring in a team. These are the players. This is what they can do. And how about you? Where do you think you want to start? Where can we begin? What are the active roles you want to take? So that it's not more time consuming. It's actually kind of streamlining. And you're just being more effective because you are listening and you're going to get to a joint agreement instead of the provider going in with expectations or the patient going in with expectations, you come out with agreements. Expectations are one-sided, agreements are mutual, and much more power in that. 
Oh, that's fantastic. Agreements. Those are ways mm-hmm. that a provider could possibly use, like you said, by addressing time and you only have 20 minutes, you can still follow something simple like this, but you're just going to reduce the time and you may eliminate some questions. So that that's fantastic. Those are some very important elements that you pointed out that one can just uh, incorporate right away if you wanted to start out. And Beth, um, as you and I spoke briefly earlier also, you've created a PDF to help people a follow along also if they wanted to correct we can we can link yes. that in our show notes yes absolutely they'll be available and you know a little bit more you know easily digestible so you can listen and then read right awesome. yes i i just wanted to make sure that um of course my listeners are welcome to make notes if they wanted to but you don't have to you can just download this pdf from our show notes if you wish and we'll link that in there that's lovely. So one of the very powerful statements of this you made was it's a way of being. And, you know, it takes a little bit of practice to be something that you haven't been in the past, but it's not impossible. And as they, as they say, you know, it's simple. It may not be easy when you start out, but then it just becomes a part of you. Right. You might, have, there might be some things just to unlearn you know, that drive that, you know, I have to fix, this has to be done, it becomes the numbers, and it's all understandable, but there's a different way of being in it, you know, Mm -hmm. it's a different way of, if you're you're going to, you're going to have to get through it, it's just your, your desire or your intention about how you're going to get through it, you know, there's a lot of difference in that, choosing the piece, choosing the order, choosing to listen. Uh, but you're right, it does take practice. And it also takes feedback. You know, then it, as a provider, oh, how do I feel now at the end of the day? Not immediate. <laughs> Give it a little bit of breathing space. Mm-hmm. And then just start to register within your own body like, oh, um, I am noticing some changes. I'm noticing some changes with my patients. I'm noticing changes within my staff. Uh, I come home and my family or my friends are noticing a little bit of a, a difference because it will start to spill over into other par- other parts of life too. Mm. So you're actually segueing into something that I was going to ask you next was like, yes, it benefits the patient to have that story um, telling as part of your visit or incorporating storytelling in your, your healthcare visit. But what kind of benefits does it have for the provider? Well, well, I'll just wrap it up just to briefly, just to say it can be transferable. This is not just a, a skill that's going to sit with an office or where a, a medical facility, it's integrity. You know, you're going to be the same person in every, you know, situation. So it's just another way of rounding out, living a bigger story, living a fuller life, being a bigger, fuller person. Part of this also helps to set boundaries. This is what I can do. This is my role. This is the patient's role. This is my team. So it manages boundaries. There's a relief and pressure. There's some releasing of like, oh, it's all up to me. It's only up to me. No, I can empower the patient. I can empower the family. I can incorporate other people. It also increases empathy. It increases job stability. The top two hiring characteristics over the next, I'm not sure how many years, but they were pinpointed in 2018 being empathy and communication. Most professions feel they can teach an awful lot, but they really can't teach communication and they definitely cannot teach empathy. Also for the provider, it uh, increases self-awareness because you can become mindful about how storytelling is impacting your own body. It reduces being automatic. Like I'm just going to go, it also takes us out of a thinking brain all of the time and drops us down into listening to our bodies and we can become really disconnected to our bodies. It has been shown, this is research out of Columbia, and it is available through their website too. Um, Just a couple things I'll know here. Increased on-the-job pleasure and increased team effectiveness. I know from my own work and also documented health by a gentleman by the name of Dr. James Pennebaker out of UT of Austin, that the health benefits are lower blood pressure, lower resting heart rate, less anxiety, uh, less depression, also reduces the impact of trauma, uh, compassion fatigue, those kind of things, just because storytelling becomes shared. 
And if storytelling is incorporated in interdepartmental or interdisciplinary, that has been shown uh, to greatly reduce isolation and stress. There is some documented e- research back in 2015 on that with a faculty member at Columbia University who did research within among teams and how much storytelling was beneficial there. And there is also, you and I had spoken about this previously to just briefly, I'll just mention something called Code Lavender. I just wanted to bring that to people's attention that its roots are in Ohio at the Cleveland Clinic. It started back in 2009, and it was a response to trying to equip healthcare providers with resources when they're going through emotionally stressful events. So that becomes art, it becomes uh, healing touch, music storytelling, art, journaling, meditation, movement, breathing. This was a way to get uh, large medical facilities to incorporate mindfulness and healing in themselves among team members to, to do this. So Code Lavender is definitely worth exploring. And that, again, started in Cleveland, and that's you know more than 10, 11 years old now. Mm. Uh, but I your little pockets popping up in other places too, saying, oh, we want to use this. In fact, there's, there are some facilities here in Madison that are starting to use it too. That's why they're using it. The research just says, hey, it helps the provider. It helps with compassion fatigue. It helps with burnout. It helps with reawakening uh, the provider to why they went into this business to begin with. And it gets them back to their roots. It's a, re- a way to reconnect. So is that how the providers are sort of creating their own stories or how they're thinking about their own story? Or is it how they're practicing that's been shown to change these outcomes or a little bit of both? Right. The first one that I had cited, that was what it means to have connection with patients on a storytelling level. Mm. effectiveness, the streamlining, the bringing in teams, the reduction of stress, the reduction of pressure, the reduction of like, I have to know everything in this moment and solve it and fix it right now, because I do, I'm going to practice some other strategies here. And then I'm going to hear to say, oh, another test is needed. And that may not be my area of expertise. Uh, I may not be integrative medicine, but I have a resource and I can refer because I am hearing that this person will definitely benefit from a more integrated approach. And I have a resource and I can connect them. Mm -hmm. The second thing you mentioned is a great way to highlight is, yes, the second thing was code lavender was really the research having to do with the fruit a provider to provider relationship. Mm-hmm. How do you process trauma? What, how do you process just what happened in an ER? How did you see things? That was the way to, to try to hide it because if it's unexpressed, then it becomes, it can be trauma traumatic and it can get stuck in the body and then it can become very, you know, it can become complicated. So that was one of the main reasons for Code Lavender having, you know, hey, we need some help for our providers. They can't be doing this all on their own. Right. And and Beth, what I'm hearing, all these elements are so very important in pain management in general, especially in children. And the thing is with children, they are so expressive, they are so creative, and it would be such an important part of their care to have something incorporated like that, especially when we think about our own children, those of us who have children or have had, um, you know, or I guess all of us that were children, what was the best part about like stories are so engaging, so interesting. Like, you know, you give the information in form of a story, you look forward to the, the sort of, why do we love those, you know, um, evenings where, you're, somebody's reading a story to you or they're telling a story or anytime somebody says once upon a time and everybody's just like glued and waiting for what comes next, right? So I think that is so relevant that we use that in pain management. The other piece about this, as you said, is there is no other discipline that is more of a prototype of how using that multidisciplinary team approach and bringing in and all the expertise to take care of a health condition more than pain management because pain affects all aspects of one's life right 
It affects one physically, emotionally, socially, functionally, sleep-wise, mood-wise, your relationship, and even fiscally, right? Economically. So there are challenges that occur because of pain. And then there are obviously areas that we can draw from to address all those challenges. So I completely agree with you and I see it and I hope my my uh, audience will see it as well is how important it is especially for pain providers to incorporate that kind of narrative in their healthcare services and you know in your bite and the kids are so much easier to reach uh you can ask them to draw something and that could be even more effective than words you could say oh what's your favorite story and then in which character are you you know or in which character is your pain or how you see your pain. And that will give you a much deeper look, even at how they're feeling. What color is it? What does the smell like, taste like? If it was a character, how would it dress? Or how do you feel? What's your relationship with it? This is how I feel. It just gives a much deeper. And you know what? It also is going to help the child to put words to something. And the other thing is even to help the child name emotions is healing enough. Well, is that, you know, make you feel how? naming an emotion can help reduce the anxiety. That's not going to take a lot longer, you know, mm-hmm. in a, in a room, right? It's just, and how does that make you feel? Boom. And, and kids don't typically ramble on, you know, in the, in it, but just to, and they're very quick and they don't have a million filters to run through and they're not necessarily trying to, to please you. So it can be a very, it can be, i you know, just the most effective way. And most of the fruit that I have seen has really come from, from children. They, they just, they want to tell a story. This is how it goes. This is my role. This is the role pain plays. And this is how I really want it to be. I really want to be the hero. I want to wear the cape and I want to get it off the back of the pain because I don't Mm -hmm. think it needs to be the leader anymore. Absolutely. And it actually gives them a healthier way or a creative way to relate to that pain rather than sort of becoming or letting the pain become their identity. Yes. And that is the most important part of storytelling. Thank you, doctor, for highlighting that is if it's about identity and as a provider, you have the ability to help the patient form a different identity that is separate from the pain. It is pain is part of the story. A whole person integrates the things that are wonderful and beautiful in life and the things that are just not. And that makes for a whole story. But it is identity because at that point, the patient really just feels like that's who and what they are and what it will always be. So by listening, by giving hope, by putting some power back in the hands of the patient, that can pull them out of that hyper, you know, that that state. And just as a, it's the pain itself, yes, but it's also the emotion that goes with it and that it builds a memory. And I know you know this and and almost 100% of the listeners will. So even as a provider it can help the patient disconnect the emotion from the pain or at least lessen it so that they can start to stand away from it and like, okay, this is me in pain. This is me in my body, or this is me someplace else. And it also can give them a chance to really try to befriend their body rather than alienating it from, from it because they think it's being, it's betraying them, which is really not the truth. So there's a lot of power in that. We'll pause here for now and cover the rest in part two of this episode. And I'm going to encourage you to reflect on how or if and when you've been using storytelling in your own practice or how you can use what Beth shared with us today into your practice if you haven't been using some of these tactics. I would also suggest that you Try and find out what is available at your own institution to support and develop the aspects of narrative medicine or storytelling in your clinical practice. And if it's not available within your institution, see where you might be able to access these resources. And in part two of this episode, we will further this conversation. We're going to learn about what types of language or words might be useful, what patient-centeredness means in this context. And you know what? You might be surprised by what she has to say.
but I am pretty sure you're going to agree with what she says. So don't forget to listen next time. I'll see you then. Bye now. Pedia Pain Focus is brought to you by Proactive Pain Solutions, a company committed to improving the access, quality, and expertise in pediatric pain care. Through our online education and consultation for clinicians and institutions, we're transforming pediatric pain medicine. We're creating experts and leaders in the field and empowering patients and families with knowledge and tools for self-management to live a functional life. If you wish to advance your pain care expertise or improve the operational performance of your pain care services, please give us a call at www.proactivepainsolutions.com.